Hey, John here. Let's look at this thing called RAID, okay? Now, I was always taught that it stands for Redundant Array of Inexpensive Discs. But alternately, it makes perfect sense that you could call it a Redundant Array of Independent Discs. Now, before we dive into the details of what RAID is, let's look at how a hard disk really works and what the motivation behind RAID is in the first place. All right, so here's an old hard drive. If you look closely on here, it's got a manufacturing date of 18th of December, 1994. Uh, yeah, I don't think I care about this one anymore. Uh, so I've taken the liberty of removing all the bolts and cutting the, the, uh, the tag here, thus voiding the warranty. Oh, well, I can't return it now. So let's look and see what we have inside here. You got this little thing that moves back and forth like this, and you've got this mounted on a spindle here, these platters. If you look closely... Uh, I don't know how well that shows on the camera, but you can certainly see the light glare on there's three metal platters here all stacked up one after another. OK, this thing here is called a head assembly and it moves in and out. And when it's out, you can sort of see there's a couple of fingers or arms that reach in between these platters. Now, there's three platters. And the arms reach in between each one of the pairs. And each one of those arms, there's two heads that look like this. So on both sides of any one platter, these will come together and allow it to, what we'll say, read uh, each one of the faces of the three platters, giving us a total of six heads mounted on these arms, okay? So the disc spins around like this at about 7,600 RPM, and there's some magnets and stuff in here that allow us to uh, programmatically move it in and out. Now, depending on where you move this head while the disc is spinning, what you can see happens is the, the magnetic surface of each of these platters can be sensed by this little head that's on the end of these arms here, okay? So depending on where you move this, what we're doing is we're using the head here at the tip of this to uh, sense all of the magnetic fields and whether they're facing one way or another way, and we use that to represent a bit value of a 1 or a 0. Because the set of tracks, the six tracks across the three cylinders or the six surfaces of these three cylinders all coincide with the same radius from the center here. They're all on the surface of a logical cylinder, okay? So wherever you move the head, you're moving it to what is often referred to as a different cylinder, okay? The cylinder in this case, because it has the three platters and the six heads, has six tracks, okay? So one cylinder is six tracks that go around the circle of the surface of this disc. Okay. Now, as you can see, these things are made out of, you know, real metal and stuff like that, which means that there's momentum involved. And if this disc was in fact sealed and otherwise working in good condition and not all covered with fingerprints and scratches, if you were to drop this disc, momentum would dictate that the head would bounce off the surface of this disc. Okay. So normally when the thing is not running, the heads are moved into here and parked and there's actually a magnet that holds them in there it's actually a little bit hard to to pull it away i can feel it grabbing onto that okay now the idea behind that is if you ever let the head bounce on the surface you'd move it to a place on the disc where it really doesn't matter you don't care about this innermost area you store all your data out here okay now there's a motor that moves this disc around these discs are made of metal. Again, if you drop it, maybe they could warp or bend, or the head can smash down onto and scratch the surface of this disc in an operation we call a head crash. It crashes into the surface of the disc. Or some fool like myself might open it up and get fingerprints in there. In all of these cases, what can happen is it can make it increasingly difficult for the head to actually read and sense those little magnetic reversals along the surface of one track around these platters. Now, if we were to unravel the concentric tracks from this disc and flatten them out like this, you could look at what the magnetic ones and zeros look like from the standpoint of the circuitry that reads them from the heads, okay? So what I've drawn here is a kind of a stylized, a simplistic view of what a format of an entire disc track might look like that is part of one of the cylinders on the drive. Now, one way or another, there's a notion of a thing called an index, right? So depending on how the drive motor works, 
Yeah, it, it may or may not have like a small a magnetic sensor that detects uh, a mark on the disc somewhere, maybe underneath or something like that. So every time it goes around once, there's a pulse that's generated. So the dr disc drive can know that it's spinning and it can know how fast it's spinning and it can know it's at the beginning of a track that runs around the surface. Every time there is an index mark, we say, goes by a sensor. Now, the idea is as the disk spins, that index mark is going to generate a pulse. Then the disk will spin around 360 degrees, during which time the head, wherever it might be positioned on the surface of a platter, can read all of the bits comprising an entire track. And the way the track is formatted, this is kind of a stylized view here, is that there's a notion of a track header that might describe the track and how many sectors and how many data bytes there are per sector and things like that. After which, there's a thing called a cyclical redundancy check. And if you don't know what that is, we'll talk a little bit about it in a second. Then there's a gap, all right? These gaps are relatively important, and it really would depend on the kind of hard disk and the manufacturer that you're, uh, you know, that, that made it and how they want to format this thing, okay? The idea is that the track, as it goes underneath the head of the disk, is comprised of multiple sectors. A sector is mostly, the, the goal is that each sector has data in it, okay? Now, modern systems it would have anywhere between 512 or 4096, now, I would say not 512 to 4096 bytes in each sector, okay? It's very common for them all to be a fixed size, but there's plenty of disks out there over the course of history that have variable length data sectors, or maybe the data sectors hold more data around the outside of the disk, because as you can think about it, right, the, the linear distance around the disk out here is much longer than the linear distance around the inside, okay? So it really depends on how the manufacturer uses the simple mechanics of their device and how they format the thing, okay? And what it really boils down to is that the head can read an entire track every time the disc goes around one time. Now, the idea is that let's say I want to replace the data in this sector right here. And maybe this is, you know, sector number zero on track one. And this is track one, sector number one. This might be track one, sector number two, and so on, okay? So what happens then is when the disk is rotating underneath the head, it can essentially see all these bits going by, right? And it can analyze, oh, this is track one, sector zero. That's not the one that I want to rewrite. But I do know I want to replace the data in track one, sector one. So he knows that that's next. He waits for this gap to show up in here. Right? And the, the idea behind this gap is that that's enough time to power up uh, the current through the head of the disk so that it can remagnetize all the data that comprises this sector here and it can rewrite all this information in here. When it's done, there's another gap that allows it to turn back off before it starts ruining the bits of the sector that follows. Now this track as a whole is repeated once for each head on each cylinder of the entire disk. And to use a drive then, it's just a matter of knowing where the sectors are supposed to be, given their cylinder number and head number, and which sector number it's supposed to be, so that you can wait for the disk to rotate to the current place where the sector is on some given track, fire up the head, or if you want to know what's there, you simply wait for it to come around and use the head to read the, uh, the, the magnetic fields rather than write to them. Now let's look a little bit at this CRC thing here. What is that? Now, CRC stands for Cyclic Redundancy Check, and what it really is, is it's usually expressed in a form of a polynomial like this. Now, the idea is that this polynomial allows you to calculate a value based on all of the bits that comprise the sector of a disk. All right, you feed them one at a time through this math here. Now, this circuit here is designed to calculate this exact polynomial here, all right? Now, I point both of these out because if you Google cyclic redundancy check up here, you're going to see a whole lot of math about these polynomials. And mathematicians have proved long ago that what happens is, depending on how you construct this polynomial, you can calculate a value that is really good or not so good at representing the value of the data 
that the CRC value represents, okay? Now, depending on this polynomial, and we picked a good one here, this is the uh, CCITT 8-bit CRC. Now, this particular polynomial is one of them that's, that's known to be uh, reasonable for, for, for um, checking small amounts of data, okay? It turns out that if you're going to check 4K bytes worth of, of disk data, you're not going to use this tiny little polynomial. You'll use one that's much bigger, okay? You'll also see these in use on, like, Ethernet and SD cards. Any communication these days pretty much uses a CRC of some kind, and it will have a polynomial. I chose this one in particular because it only has a degree of eight. So the circuit, it turns out, will have eight D latches in it, which is the highest, it's the degree of your polynomial, okay? Now, the idea behind this, the math translates directly to this circuit. Even if you don't know anything about what's going on here, my point is you can look at the a, a, x to the eighth plus x squared plus x plus one, okay? Look at this circuit down here. The x to the eighth, means you have eight D latches. And this is obviously some kind of a shift register. All the clocks, these are all edge trigger D latches. You got a clock signal. So every time it clocks, the data will move this way one bit. Now, some of these bits have XOR gates in them, right? Though the gates that have the XOR gates correspond to these exponents on the terms in your polynomial. So the eight here says I have eight D latches. The rest of the exponents, namely 2, x to the 1 is the same as x, and x to the 0 is 1. So what you have is on the 0th bit, you put an XOR gate. On the 1 bit, you put an XOR gate. On the 2 bit, you put an XOR gate. And then you wire it like this. You take the output of the 8th D latch, and you bring it back to all these XOR gates like this. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details why this does with this math and so on. You can Google it and read about that yourself. My point of bringing it up right now is, given a polynomial, you know how many D latches there are, and you know where to put the XOR gates. It's just a pure coincidence that this particular one has all three XOR gates down here in a row. Usually, that's not the case as you get bigger ones. You might have a 32-bit polynomial, and you'd have an XOR gate here, and then some, you know, connected together without them and then another one over here and so on so regardless of where the xor gates are in relation to the d latches the point here is that the data if it arrives in serial form which it does when you're reading one bit at a time off a rotating disk or from a serial port or something like that the data arrives one bit at a time and every time a data bit arrives you clock your clock one time all right and you then shift the data through this circuit. And while the circuit's going, the output of this feeds back and causes these mathematical impact to occur on the data as it flows along. Now, this particular circuit here is also known as a linear feedback shift register. Okay, So you might see this word used sometimes as well. A big walk away here is that one, given a polynomial, you can convert it directly to a circuit like this that accepts serial data in and you clock it every time there's a single bit. The CRC value that's being calculated is the value that will be stored in all of these D latches, in this case the 8-bit CRC value, will be stored in those D latches when you've finished clocking all the data into this circuit. This circuit is fairly, relatively speaking, it's, it, it, it's quite simplistic, and it can run at the full speed that the data arrives one bit at a time. So for free, we say, in terms of time, we can calculate the value of a CRC while the data is arriving, okay? Now that's really useful because as the bits are read one after another, if we're reading in this sector of data, or even if we're writing the data out into the disk, we can calculate the CRC while we're moving the bits, whether you're reading them or you're writing them. And that circuit will have the CRC available and ready when this sector's done. So if you look into the math behind the CRC and the choice of a polynomial, you'll know that there's a relationship between the number of bits in this sector and the CRC that's used as a verification mechanism to validate whether the data and so on is valid, okay? So the idea is you read in all the bits of this sector, 
and you run them through your CRC generator, and then you compare what you've calculated from all these bits here to the value on the disk. And if they're the same, you can have a, a relatively good uh, faith that the data that you got from the disk is what you were supposed to receive. If the CRCs don't match, then you can be certain that what you got is not valid. All right, so let's see what that has to do with RAID here. RAID is basically a set of standard configurations that use something called striping, mirroring, and parity to create a large reliable data store using multiple, usually cheap, uh, hard drives. Okay, uh, The idea is that RAID exists in contrast to something called SLED, which stands for Single Large Expensive Disk. The idea being, of course, that if you pay a lot of money, you could get a really reliable hard drive that would you know, serve your needs and it would run for you know, a long period of time. But you can really buy a huge number of cheap drives for the same price as one, as the name suggests, Single Large Expensive Disk. Uh, in other words, you can store a whole lot more data if you can buy a whole lot of cheap drives and just hope they don't break, okay? But as we'll see, depending on how you store your data, when you are storing it in, in chunks, or what we call striping, where we would break up the various uh, portions of data that we want to store into blocks and store part of the data on, on one disk and some of the data on maybe another drive and so on. Now, depending on how we do that, we can create a situation where even if a disk breaks, we can figure out what data was supposed to be on that disk and recreate it. All right? That's where we're heading. That's the whole point of this. Now, if you don't get anything else out of this, walk away with the fact that what RAID does is it allows you to recover data that may have been lost as a result of a head crash or some other physical failure of a hard drive. RAID has to do with how you can arrange your data so that that becomes possible, all right? Now, they have these RAID levels, all right? So let's start with the simplest one here. This one doesn't actually allow you to recover anything, but it's, it's, it's related. So we'll start with RAID 0, okay? Also known as just a bunch of disks. So sometimes you'll hear people call this uh, uh, what, what they might call a JBOD array. Okay, so here, let's talk about what it means to stripe something, all right? So RAID 0, it's a striped set or a striped volume. Look what we've got here. We've got two disks. These are graphic depictions of two separate hard drives. And you have this A1, A2, A3, A4, and so on like this, all right? Now, the idea is, let's say you have a, a file called A, and it's got these eight blocks of data in it. So you can st store the first block on disk 0, the second block on disk one, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. And you can go back and forth like this as you write your file. Okay. The idea with this is that if you have all the data ready to be written to the disk and you store it on a single drive, you would have to store all eight of these blocks one after another on this one disk. Hopefully it's intuitively obvious that if, if you did store it all, all eight blocks on one drive, what you'd be looking at is the amount of time it takes to store however many bytes there are in these eight blocks on however many cylinders and in, in, uh, disk rotations it would take to move the head and write each one of those out. Okay. Now, if you store half of it on one disk and half of it on a different disk, and both of these disks are hooked up to a separate I.O. port on your computer, then what could happen is you could write out block A1 and block A2 at the same time, and then write blocks 3 and 4 at the same time, and so on. You effectively can write into this twice as fast, and likewise for reading, if you wanted to read this entire 8-block file, you could get it twice as fast as you could if it started on a single drive. Okay. Now, this is not going to help you uh, recover if one of the disks fail, 
right? You, in this case, if you, if his disc breaks uh, or becomes unreadable, or for, you know, you go to read a sector in here and you get a CRC error, and the drive can't figure out what the data is, you're you're done. That's gone. Okay. This arrangement allows you to move data twice as fast as you would if you only had a single disc, and that's the point of RAID Zero or what we call JBOD. And you can see down here under performance, it does talk about, oh, you can, you can read uh, and write up to n times faster, okay? Where n represents the total number of disks in here. This diagram only shows two drives, but rest assured, you can put three or four or five or as many as you want in here. And it would just simply go faster and faster and faster based on the number of disks. Now let's look at RAID level one. RAID one is more useful if you're concerned yourself with reliability. The idea with RAID one, sometimes called a mirror, okay, what, you, what you're going to do is notice in the scenario before we had eight blocks. Now we're looking at four blocks. And look what we see here, A1, A1, A2, A2, A3, A3, A4, A4, like this. The idea here is you store you know, I got an idea. Let's back up the data, right? <laughs> Call me crazy. Why don't I store this same block on disk zero and on disk one at the same time? That way, if one of my disks fail, I have a copy. All right. Yeah, I don't know how much genius it took to come up with that idea, but it is not a bad idea. And you see this used fairly often. And again, you can add a third disk, a fourth disk, a fifth, and however many you want. And you can just make as many copies as you want. Every time you store anything or modify one of these blocks of data, you re-update the value that's stored on every single disk or what we might call a spindle. Now, hopefully it's intuitively obvious that if I've stored the same thing on two different disks and one of them should fail for some reason, I can still get my data on the remaining disk or disks, okay? Now, this doesn't help me store data any faster because obviously if I have to store my data on two disks, I just have to write it out on both, right? And I'm going to use both disks to make that happen. Hopefully, my computer is designed such that both disks can write uh, the data onto their, onto their platters at the same time, thus allowing me to at least write at the same speed as uh, what I could get with a single disk. However, if I want to read data and I have two spindles, I can read it from either disk 1 or disk 0 thus achieving the same kind of performance I got with RAID 0 when it comes to reading, okay? Because if I wanted to, I could read A1 from disk 0 while reading A2 from disk 1, and then when those two are done, I can read A3 from disk 0 and A4 from disk 1 and so on. So I can get double performance on reading if I have two disks, or triple if I have three disks and so on, but I get the same performance as I would with a single disk when writing. Now, the benefit, obviously, of RAID 1 over RAID 0, you pay for it in slower write times, but if the head should crash or the motor should fail for some whatever reason, or maybe I'm just going to have a power failure or pull the drive out because it's old and throw it in the garbage, replace it with a new one, whatever the copy, the mirror, as we say, still has all my data and it can continue to run. And depending on the kind of hard drives and almost all drives today, and even in your home PCs, these so-called SATA disks are able to be uh, pulled out of a system while the power is on. And most uh, controllers that support RAID will allow you to do what's called a hot swap. I can unplug a disk. The system will notice that the data doesn't work anymore <laughs> while writing to this disk. I then reinsert a different disk. And what will happen is it'll say, oh, I, I have a new disk that replaced an old one. It will go back over to the existing disks that were not removed and copy the data from that back over to this and recreate your, your mirror, okay? I want a two-disk mirror. As long as one of them is always working, you can always replace one as it ages. When that one's done, you can pull out the other one and replace it, and then it'll make a copy from disk one back over to disk zero, and this can run 24-7 forever, even if you want to change the physical drives. Now let's look at RAID uh, level two here. This one's kind of a weird 
concept, but it's related. And there was a company called uh, Thinking Machines that built a system called a connection machine, which included a thing called a data vault. And there's a picture of it here. This is a uh, uh, this is like 30 some years ago. And what happened was they built this giant, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe they got a cue from Apple or something. So they designed a cabinet that was this big round arc thing and filled it up with a bunch of disk drives. Now, the way this thing works for RAID 2 is, as it says, rarely used in practice. I, I've never known it to be used personally anywhere other than the data vault on a CM1 machine, we used to call that thing. It was actually a really neat looking system with a bunch of lights on it and a big cube. And it was just, it was just really cool for its time. You know, if it was 30 uh, some years ago, uh, that, was, that was the uh, state of the art, okay? Now, the way this thing worked is you had a bunch of spindles like this. And each one of these spindles, as you can see, they're synchronized so that each one disk is at the exact same angle at all times. So they're all spinning around perfectly synchronized. Okay, want to talk? Um, I, I don't think inexpensive uh, describes this <laughs> in any way. Okay, but the idea was that if you wanted to write, uh, let's say I had eight disks and I wanted to store a single byte onto those eight disks, I could store one bit here, one bit here, one bit here, one bit here, and so on across all these drives. The idea is that it would run that much faster. Now, notice the difference between this thing and a JBOT array. This thing stores one bit on each one of these spindles, and it requires them all to be perfectly synchronized. Now, there's some uh, data over here that has to do with correcting errors and things like that. I'm not going to get into the details of that. It's, it's sort of like having a CRC This uh, in the simplest of terms. I mean, call me out in the, in the comments if you know exactly what I, what, how these works uh, using what's called a Hamming code. The uh, idea is... This was essentially your 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 block check character or your frame check sequence or a CRC. All those words mean the same kind of thing. There's a bit pattern here that represents the validity of all of the bits over here. Okay. Now this thing was outrageously expensive and it went fast relative to uh, what was available at the time, but it was just outrageously expensive. It's pretty much uh, not not currently used at all today, okay? RAID 3, in a similar vein, is not really used much anymore. It's the same idea as RAID 2, but what you do is rather than spreading a byte across multiple spindles, you, what you do is you put one byte, a whole byte on like spindle 1, a whole byte on spindle 2, a whole byte on spindle 3, and again you might have parity or some sort of an error check on disk three over here. Again, not used very often. I'm not gonna get into the details of that. Let's get on to RAID 4. This is a useful uh, model. This doesn't get used at all, but the thing is, uh, as is the case on many things in computing, the easy to understand version of how we explain things is not always the highest performing one, okay? So let's look very closely at what RAID 4 is, and we'll see that RAID 4 and RAID 5 are logically identical. However, there's a difference in what happens with this disk 3 over here that makes it more practical, all right? It's a very simple difference but it complicates the description of how the thing works. So let's look and see what this thing does. The idea is you have this, what they call block level striping, okay? So this can be used with the kind of disk that I just showed you a minute ago that might have a single block or a single sector that is 4K bytes, okay? So the first 4K bytes of, say, a file might be stored on this spindle over here. The second 4K bytes of that file might be stored on, on this spindle here, and so on. While the parity is stored on this spindle over here. Now let's remember how the exclusive OR function works. The way this thing works is the output of this function is true if the input has an odd number of ones in it. Zero ones, that's an even number, so the output is zero. A zero and a one here, there's only a single bit that's set to one here, therefore, 
the parity is odd, and the output of the function is true. This parity is also odd. There's a single bit here that's set to 1. The XOR function is true. Even number of 1s, the XOR function is false. Now we can extrapolate this out to having three inputs or four inputs or more, right? Because remember, the exclusive OR function simply is true when there's an odd number of ones in its input. So this is going to be a zero, that's going to be a one. There's an odd number of ones here. There's an even number of ones there. There's an odd number of ones here. Even, even, odd. Okay, so there's the truth table of the XOR function. Now, due to the nature of this, let's say I cover up one of these columns here, and I ask you, redefine what the value is of A based on the fact that you know B and C, and you know the resulting X or value of what A, B, and C were when you knew all of them. Well, you know that this thing is true whenever the parity is odd. So if I cover up any one of these columns, you can easily tell me that you know that the missing A over here has to be a zero. In order for this to be true here, and I have to have an odd number of ones over here, well, I have an odd number of them already, therefore A must be a zero. Because obviously if it was a one, then there would be an even number of ones here, and the XOR function would have originally been a zero. Okay, now you can do that for any one of these columns. And it doesn't matter how many inputs you have in this function. If one and only one of these becomes an unknown, you can recreate that column using the originally calculated XOR output and combine it with the two columns that you do know. So with that in mind, let's look again back at what RAID 4 is all about here. Now, if I wrote a block of, say, 4K bytes onto this spindle here, and 4K here, and 4K here, and 4K here, and the 4K bytes here, all right, think of it in bits. 4K bytes times 8 bits per byte is really 32K bits, all right? Now, if I take the 32 kilobits here, and the 32K bits here, and the 32K bits here, all right? And I XOR the first of the 32K bits with the first bit here of the 32K. And I XOR it with the 30, first of the 32K bits on this bit over here. I would then have calculated the parity of the first bit out of each of the blocks on these three spindles. And I could then store that bit on the disk 3 spindle over here. And I would just do that math 32,000 times so that all of the bits in each of these blocks would have their parities on this spindle over here. So, if I were to lose a disk for whatever reason, the head crashes or it wears out, the motor breaks or something along those lines, I can determine what should have been in A3 all along because I have two of the three inputs to the XOR function plus the answer of the XOR function on this disk here, and I can recreate that missing data. This is enormously useful and more valuable in some circumstances than the mirroring. Well, let's look what happens here. If I have four disks in an array that's doing RAID 4, I can store 75%, I can use 75% of the data of the disks to store data. If I'm just on a mirrored system, I have to only use half, 50% of the uh, disks that are in that array, if it's a two disk array in, in, in a mirrored system, okay? In a four disk mirror, I would use only a quarter of the total space available for my data. And, and again, the mirror would, would store all of its copies everywhere. So this is a fairly decent benefit in that I get more utilization of the disks. And I can put as many disks as I want in here. I can have a 10-disk array or a 20-disk array, 
and still have a single spindle for the parity. Now, the more discs I put in here, the increased odds are that I might have two break at the same time, which would be a bit of a bummer. Plus, the price goes up because you then have to actually buy 20 discs in order to have 20 discs. All right. Now, uh, the minimum number of discs you can use for the RAID 4, in theory, you could have two discs, but that would be the same thing as a mirror. You know, all right. I mean, Now, you, you, the minimum you could have is basically three disks, right? You need to have uh, two inputs to the XOR function in order to calculate your parity value to store it on your, on your parity spindle, okay? Now, the way this thing works in terms of performance is not too bad, as long as you don't want to read A1, B1, C1, and D1, you know, the B, this block of each of these maybe uh, four separate files that have been striped, as we'd say, across all these drives, okay? If you wanted to read A1 and C3 at the same time, you wouldn't have a problem with that, okay? So the notion that this thing can improve your performance in some way, yes, it can, but it really depends on what data you want because some of the stuff is blocked, because it's all stored in one single unique location, even though you can recover it like you would in a mirror if you lost one of the drives. Now, let's think about the whole idea that I was talking about with the CRCs, okay? It should be easy to notice what happens if there's an entire disk failure, like the power goes out or the motor breaks, or somebody unplugs disk number two, right? I mean, the machine can easily determine that that is the case. You know, it's it's sending data somewhere and that is no longer present, or it's you know, reading data from something that just simply stops talking. That's easy for an operating system to figure out. What's not so easy is if the data is arriving and nobody bothers to tell the operating system that the data is invalid, all right? So it's absolutely critical in order for this to function that these disks have a mechanism independent of the idea of RAID, that they have a mechanism whereby if I say, give me this block of data at you know wherever A3 is stored on this disk, that when it gives it to me, it can also tell me whether it thinks it's garbage or not. It has to be able to have a way of knowing that so that the operating system can know that this disk has gone bad. All right? Again, think about that. If the disk is communicating, I ask it to do something, and it says, okay, and here's some data that I got off the disk platter. If no one tells the operating system when that data is bad, the operating system cannot know otherwise, okay? It might know by reading A1, A2, A3, and the parity. It can recalculate the, the parity if no one tells it A3 is bad, and it turns out it noticed the parity is wrong, the operating system can say, well, okay, something's wrong, but it cannot know whether disk 3, 2, 1, or 0 has been where the failure is. So it's critical with RAID to know whether the data from each block on each cylinder has been read back correctly or not. Now, in the obvious case where the disk is unplugged, that's easy. In the less obvious case, there has to be some kind of a CRC check or something. So when the disk drive gives the data back, it can also say, by the way, the CRC for this sector didn't match when I read it back in. So don't trust this. Then and only then does the operating system know, A, there's an error, and B, it's this disk right here. Knowing which disk is bad, it can stop using this disk and reconstitute what should have been there by reading in the block that, that you know, the second block on all the remaining disks and the parity and recreate that missing bit. So your system continue to run in what we call a degraded mode as long as one of the disks has gone bad and not, not two, okay? At most, one disk can be bad in a RAID 4 array and continue to function in a degraded mode, you can then replace the disk 
and the system can recreate all the data on the disk, what we call rebuilding all the contents of that disk. Once it's all fully been rewritten, the, the RAID array is back in full uh, operation, okay? Now, now, what's this about RAID 4 being a problem versus some other thing that's more complicated? Well, what happens in RAID 4 is if I want to replace a block that's stored here on C3, what I have to do is I have to read in the, the value from like C1 and C2 and recalculate the parity here in order to update the parity drive over here because I've changed one of the inputs potentially, okay? Now, another way to do that, I could optimize it a little bit. I don't need to read all these volumes to do that. If I want to replace the data in C3, what I can do is if I have the old copy of the data and the new copy of the data, I can know in what way the parity for the whole row here, all these, this stripe as we say, I can know in what way the parity will have changed. So I can make a small advancement by saying I know what C3 used to be, I know what I want to change it to, I can read the parity disk only, and I can know how that parity needs to change based on that information. I can recreate a new uh, block image and write back C3 and the parity block over here, and then I'm done with that operation, okay? So what, 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 what happens if you make that optimization, if you touch anything on any of these three disks over here, we have a contention problem on disk three. No matter what you edit or alter on any of these other spindles, you have to always go back and either read and rewrite the parity that's over here on disk three in order to make it match after you've changed, say, C2 over here. Or if I change A3, I still have to update the, uh, the parity for that block on disk 3 here. All right? So you end up with a performance problem just due to the nice simplistic nature of how you've laid your data out here. In comes RAID 5. Exactly the same thing as RAID 4, but look very closely. You notice you have your A1, A2, A3 in the parity, just like you did with A4. But... B1, B2, and B3 are stored like this with that parity on a different spindle. C is stored with the parity again on a different spindle and so on. If there was an E on here in the diagram, and I wish they would have drawn that in, it would help the dri drive home this point, there would be an E1, E2, E3, and then the parity for E would be over here. So this is going to be basically like a barber pole and distribute the parity evenly across all the disks. So if I wanted to update A2 and B1, let's say, at the same time, I actually can. Because I would need to, you know, like I said, in that optimization, I would have to read the old value of A2 and the old parity using spindles 1 and 3 do a calculation, and then write A2 back in here and write the parity back onto uh, disk 3 over here. And that could happen at the same time that I'm reading and rewriting the B1 sector and the BP sector using disks 0 and 2 at the same time. Now, granted, if I wanted to update A2 and B2 at the same time, yes, I'd have to do them one after another because they happen to share the same spindle for those sectors. But while I'm doing the parity, at least those would be uh, uh, rotated across different spindles. So you can see some performance improvement here. Okay. So it turns out that nobody ever uses RAID 4. They use RAID 5 because there is this opportunity for a performance improvement at no real uh, cost uh, to the software, okay? Now, there's a minor uh, cost to trying to understand why the heck the parity is in a weird place and, well, where, which, which, which block is store, has the parity on disk 2 versus disk 0, as you can clearly see. It's usually done with a simple modulo arithmetic type of thing, you know, modulo n, how many drives you have, you know, that sort of a thing. Now, this is pretty popular, and just like RAID 4, if one disk fails, the system runs in a degraded mode, and it can be fully rebuilt if you replace the bad disk.
But of course, you cannot lose more than one disc at the same time. As soon as you lose your second disc, you've lost everything. All right? It just becomes garbage. You cannot reconstitute two drives if they should both fail at the same time. Now, maybe your system runs unattended for long periods of time, and if it loses one disc, it might take a while before somebody shows up, and maybe it would end up losing a second disc before somebody can get there to, to, to perform maintenance to replace the first disc that had failed. And in other words, it'd be nice to be able to continue running in a degraded mode if I actually lose two discs instead of only uh, allowed uh, being allowed to, to, to lose one disc like you do in RAID 5 and RAID 4. Well, that's what RAID 6 is for, okay? Now, I'm going to jump to the bottom here because uh, it's not as simple as simple parity, all right? The, what happens here is RAID 6, the definition of RAID 6 is any form of RAID that can continue to execute with read and write requests to any one of the, you know, the virtual disks, right? And these are, you know, essentially all treated as if it is just one single giant, you know, as they say, virtual disk, right? Or each of the disks in here might be considered virtual as well, because you could obviously remove it and put a different one in its place, right? Uh, if it should fail. Uh, anyway, back to the official definition is that it is any form of RAID that can continue to execute, read, and write with uh, up to two concurrent disk failures, okay? Now, in order for that to happen... As I said, you can't use basic simple parity, and the answer for that is uh, obvious, because if you look at how the striping works here, if I were to lose disk number one, and I need to reconstitute this block here for A2, I would have A1, A3, and I would have two copies of the parity over here. If it was simple parity, I could use one of these, to recreate that. Same thing would happen here for B2. I got B1 and I got B3 over here and I could use one of what would be a simple parity bit in this hypothetical scenario to recreate that missing block here. The parity here would disappear on this stripe, which we could just read back on disk number two over here and so on for each one of these uh, missing blocks. Now, if while disk one is gone, I ended up with a failure on disk two as well. Well, in the case where I have to recreate B2, I still could, because I would have B1 and I would have B3 in, in, in one of the parity bits over here, and I could recreate this, and I could even recreate this parity bit there, again, if it was simple parity. Same would hold true for this C stripe here. I've just lost the parity bits. So what? I can recreate those by you know, using C1, C2, and C3. The D stripe here would be okay as well, because I could just copy it over from the other parity bit there, or I could recreate it from these three bits over here. However... If you look at the A stripe and the E stripe, the same can't be said. If I lose both A2 and A3, and, again, in this hypothetical scenario, if these are just simple parity bits, I cannot recreate it for two that are missing. Can't be done. So the idea is that in RAID 6, you use a different kind of parity, or you use completely different kind of math altogether, when you create these so-called parity bits, okay? One way is to use what they call diagonal parity. That should be in here, yeah, right here, or a Hamming code or something like that. And what happens is in those scenarios, you have more than one parity bit that checks these volumes. And diagonal might be that this parity is really uh, working on an angle. So instead of checking all the Bs, it really checks this block here the on all the other blocks that are on this diagonal line. And it would wrap around and come over to here and like that. Okay, And then this parity bit over here might work on a different angle. Okay, and if you did that and you lost two drives, you you you, you know, or something along those lines, you could end up with uh, being able to reconstitute the the missing disk. Point is, you use more complicated math, and you can solve this problem. And for those situations where you do need to be able to uh, survive through more than a single disk failure, this is quite useful. 
those are the to the seven total uh, raid levels, okay? Raid zero through six. And as I believe the top of this web page points out, you can combine these, okay? So raid 10, sometimes people call it, or raid one plus zero, right? Well, what does that really mean? Well, that means that you take a raid one, okay, which is a mirror, and then combine it with a RAID 0. So that these two disks here really represent this logical disk over here, or the virtual disk here. Okay? So what you can do is take two disks to represent disk 0 here, and two disks to represent disk 1 over here, in order to create a larger amount of data that's stored in your array. Now, I don't know anyone who's done that personally, but I do know people that have done a RAID 5 plus 1, okay? The idea there is you put an entire RAID 5 array here and a RAID 5 array over here. So uh, remember RAID 5 was this guy down here. 4 and 5 are essentially the same thing. It's got the single parity bit. So if I take these four disks, three out of four of these disks hold data, and then I take another entire RAID 5 array with the same number of four disks over here. I store the entire same data on this RAID 5 array over on the left, as well as the RAID 5 array over here on the right. The idea there being that I've now gained this double performance that I get with a mirrored setup, like I did with RAID 1, plus I can lose one disk from this RAID 5 array and one disk from the other RAID 5 array at the same time and still be fully functioning. Now, because it's mirrored, if I lost two drives out of this RAID 5 array here, the other RAID 5 array would still be running and I'd be okay. In fact, I could lose all the drives out of one of these two arrays. The other one would still have all my data and be running at full capacity. After losing all the disks in this array, I can still even lose one disk in the other one. I just can't lose more than one in each of the two arrays at the same time. All right. If you wanted to do that, you could do a, a RAID 6 plus 1 or a RAID 61, somebody might call that. Then I could lose two drives out of one RAID 6 array and up to two drives out of the other one and have the mirror in still operating at full capacity. And as soon as I lost a third drive out of this RAID 6 array, I would have then made this entire RAID 6 array worthless, and I would then be operating on a degraded RAID 6 array on the other side of my mirror, okay? So the, the, po the point is you sometimes see this written out as RAID 6 plus 1 or RAID 61 if you want to mirror a pair of RAID 6s, and the same thing with the RAID 5s. All right, so why does all this matter? It matters because I can now buy cheap disks and know that it's perfectly fine if one of them dies, as long as I'm around to replace it before a second one dies, or a third and a fourth and so on, if I have a RAID 6 one or something like that, right? So it increases my reliability and increases your cost a little bit, but the idea is I can use cheap disks knowing full well that uh, eventually one of them will fail as long as I replace it before it gets out of hand. I can save a ton of money. I can also get an increased throughput. If I have a whole bunch of disks and I have a single giant you know, logical view of all the data on those disks so that when I store a file, some of the files stored on each one of these spindles, I have an enormous increase in throughput that's proportional to the number of disks that are in the array. Minus, of course, the number of parity bits, right? But still, it's an increase because they're all running in parallel. If I then mirror one of these things, a RAID 5 or a RAID 6 or whatever, I can even further double my read speed. Okay? Remember, the writing, you have to write both halves of the mirror and or you have to write the data block you're updating as well as recalculate your parity in a RAID 5 or a RAID 6. Okay? And in a mirror, you'd have to do that on both sides at the same time. 
So you can see that the mirror will double your read performance regardless of what it's constructed as. And the RAID 5 and RAID 6 style increases your write speed based on how many data spindles there are. Okay, or RAID 5, if I have four spindles, I have increased my write speed three to one. Because remember, one of the spindles holds parity, and that's not really my, my, my data. That's just overhead to maintain the ability to reconstruct something if I lose one of the drives, okay? So if I have four disks, I have a three to one increase in my write capacity. If I have a write five plus one, it's still just three to one because the mirror doesn't improve writing, but it doubles my reading. I have a six to one increase on reading and a three to one increase on writing if I have a mirrored RAID 5, which we call a RAID 5 plus one. All right? So thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.